function. And both those things are usually considered in association with a pregnancy where the babies have started to develop either cardiac dysfunction or indeed a hydropic in the presence of those lesions. So pleural effusions complicate about one in 10,000 pregnancies. They're much more commonly to present bilaterally than they are unilaterally, 75% bilateral, 25% unilateral. And if left untreated or just observed, in over three quarters of the cases, they will progress to, and the fetus will become sick and develop fetal hydrops, which if not treated or remote from delivery will lead to death. Um, the uh, um, pleural effusions can be primary, which are usually associated with thoracic ducts abnormalities and the presence of chylothoraces with the pleural fluid containing high densities of lymphocytes. Well, they can be secondarily, and just like with diaphragmatic hernia that we heard about this morning, there is a significant association with chromosomal abnormalities. So um, it's important to look for other malformations and also to consider fetal carrier typing to exclude uh, common autosomal trisomies, but also monosomy X. And increasingly, as we heard from um, Dr. Palladini this, this morning, um, uh, with the exclusion of uh, autosomal tri trisomies in the first trimester, the contribution of genetic anomalies and genomic syndromes, Noonan syndrome, FOXC2 mutations associated with pleural effusions and high drops are, are increasingly noted. Now I'll speak tomorrow about the fact that 12% of um, cases of non-immune high drops are associated with genetic disease. And of course, there can be other underlying structural abnormalities and right-sided congenital diaphragmatic hernia can certainly present with a unilateral pleural effusion, um, as, as can, can complex cardiac abnormalities. The outcome and rationale for treatment really is therefore dependent upon the underlying etiology. And um, to triage these babies by looking for abnormalities and excluding chromosomal and genetic abnormalities is very important because the prognosis isn't just dependent upon the ultrasound appearances, but the underlying cause. But overall and overarching, it's worsened by hydrops vitalis. And so the rationale for treatment would be to reduce the risks of progression to fetal hydrops. Um, fetal hydrops often caused by uh, cardiac dysfunction, usually right-sided cardiac failure with um, inferior vena cava compression and metastinal shift, um, but also um, theoretically to reduce the risks of um, pulmonary hyperplasia going forward in the presence of these pleural effusions. And of course, babies with pleural effusions, usually as they progress, if untreated, are associated with polyhydramnus, and that's associated with, the, with um, preterm birth. So again, that will have an impact on survival. In terms of the treatment of uh, fetal hydrothoraces with or without hydrops, there are no randomized controlled trials comparing the different interventions, but from cohort studies, whether they be prospective, but mainly retrospective, um, no treat in no treatments, then babies um, that are hydropic or non-hydropic have about a quarter of those babies will, will survive, about 20 to 25%. Of course, it's possible, certainly at the time of diagnosis, and especially if there's a unilateral pleural effusion, to consider single thoracocentesis to drain the, the, the pleural effusion at the same time as carrier typing the baby. And certainly the pleural effusion can be a good source of lymphocytes to do that. So you often can do it through one procedure backed up by an amniocentesis. And some people have um, described multiple thoracocentesis during pregnancy, but that has a disadvantage in meeting multiple interventions and carries about a 54% survival rate, but increased risk of pre-labor pre ruptured membranes. Thoraco um, uh, amniotic shunting, therefore, has the potential advantage in trying to treat the fetus at one go um, with the, the risks of that insertion, um, uh, but then not requiring further intervention going on. At least that's the theory. And the 
um, retrospective cohort series indicate about a 70% 70, 70 survival in babies treated this way. The thoracoamniotic shunts, they fall into two main groups uh, really, and they both, all of these um, shunts require uh, the, a needle and a trocar to um, deliver the shunt, um, the, proximal, the, the, the proximal end into the pleural effusion and the distal end um, into the amniotic cavity. And they are the Harrison shunt, which is a silo elastic um, uh, uh, shunt, a pigtail catheter. You can see it curls up when it went outside of the introducer. Um, and that usually goes down a uh, 16 gauge needle or a rocket shunt, which is what I have traditionally preferred, which was um, developed by Charles Rodek um, when he was at King's College in London. And again, has a titanium tip um, for visualization. Again, they have the same principle with a pigtail catheter um, being unfolded as it's introduced through the trocar into the fetal effusion and then pulled back into the amniotic cavity. More recently, rocket shunts have been temporarily withdrawn from manufacture. So I've been using the Somatex shunt, which is titanium mesh shunt. Um, and again, that has an advantage of going down a 17 gauge needle, but they all work on the same principle. This is the, um, the insertion of a shunt. You can see you put the needle and the trocar under ultrasound guidance into the pleural effusion, and then your assistant helps unfold the shunt. So the pigtail catheter comes out into the pleural effusion, and then you withdraw the um, introducer so that the other end can unfold into the amniotic cavity. And therefore there is a sh the shunt going across the thoracic wall, um, usually between the ribs um, and um, allowing the insertion of the shunt and the fluid to drain from an area of high pressure within the chest to low pressure in the amniotic cavity, and that will continually drain. As I've said, these are the um, uh, series that um, have documented the insertion of, um, uh, of shunts and single center series. The largest one is from Greg Ryan's um, unit in 2010. Um, and you can see the prognosis of survival, even insertion of um, pleuroamniotic shunts for pleural effusion is dependent upon the presence of um, hydrops at, at diagnosis. Hydropic babies have about a 55 to 60% survival, whereas non-hydropic babies have about an 85% survival overall. The complications of shunts insertions really are not dissimilar to what I was talking about with uh, transfusions this morning. Any um, needle introduced into the amniotic cavity carries the risk of amenorexis and pre-labor, pre-term pre rupture of membranes, about 5% of cases. There's a small risk of infection. Uh, less than 1%, and that's uh, mitigated by giving prophylactic antibiotics and using aseptic technique. Membrane separation can occur, and as I say, be associated with amenorexis. Fetal demise, especially in the sick fetus, the hydropic fetus, can occur. And then the two big problems, I suppose, with placing in utero shunts are the fact that they can dislodge, the fetus can pull it out, um, or it can block. In my experience, that's much less likely to occur when you use a rocket shunt in the thorax for thoracoamniotic uh, shunting than it is in for psychoamniotic shunting, when it's much more common to, to, to block or fall out. And of course, although this is procedures are done under continuous ultrasound, there is the risk of um, maternal, uh, theoretically, and certainly fetal trauma. There have been um, cases of trauma diagnosed in, in, in inserting these shunts. Congenital pulmonary airway malformations is the other indication for insertion of these shunts. And these are usually um, abnormalities of lung development in the pseudoglandular and canicular phases of development, um, usually between 14 and 24 weeks gestation. And, they're associated with abnormal pulmonary branch, uh, branching. The abnormalities are, are of two histological, pathological kinds. So there's congenital 
adenoid malformation of the lung, which is an imbalance of uh, cellular pr proliferation and apoptosis in a airway development. And there's focal dysplasia and um, skeletal pluripotent cells within uh, the abnormal um, segment of the lung. Now you'll remember from your uh, development that the left side of the lung has about 29 uh, lung segments, the right side has 32. And it's only one of these segments, just like segments of an orange, that is involved in this process. They can be macrocystic or they can be microcystic. And I'll show you examples of those two forms in a minute. The second type, which can be very difficult to differentiate them from CCAM, is bronchopulmonary sequestration. And again, the immature supernumerary areas of lung tissue, which can be differentiated because they have a secondary blood supply, not from the pulmonary circulation, but usually from an aberrant aortic uh, branch. And they um, can be classified as intralobar or extralobar. So the pathological diagnosis of CCAM, cystic adenoid malformation, comes from the soccer classification when Type 1 is where there are large cysts. Uh, type 2 is where there's mainly small cysts, but moderate cysts. And type 3, where there is micro cysts. And you can see that this conveniently translates into the ultrasound appearances. And these are the three types. So macrocystic are large, fluid-filled cysts, um, usually uh, unilateral, very rarely multilateral. Uh, but bilateral. You can get mixed lesions where there is cystic, uh, um, large cysts and small cysts, and microcystic type 3 lesions where there is a ground glass appearance of what appears to be almost the whole of the lung and is in effect, and I'm emphasizing, just a small segment of the lung that's involved. MRI, in some cases, um, can be useful in, in differentiating between CCAM and bronchopulmonary dis, um, uh, sequestration. Um, uh, but uh, often, I guess, from um, an ultrasound point of view, bronchopulmonary sequestration is, uh, the diagnosis is aided by the visualization using color flow Doppler, and that's helped by low flow these days um, in terms of seeing the aberrant feeding vessel going to the uh, pulmonary sequestration. So it can be um, most commonly intralobar, where it's uh, surrounded by the normal lung and also surrounded by pleura. Um, extralobar, where it's still within the thorax, uh, but is not surrounded by pleura. And sometimes MRI can be useful in differentiating that. And extrathoracic extralobar, where you can actually get these abnormal uh, areas that are outside the thorax. Um, and again, um, using um, ultrasound and MRI and color flow Doppler can help make this diagnosis. This is um, uh, a picture on ultrasound of an extralobar sequestration, and you can see it's separate from the normal lung. Um, surrounded by a secondary pleural effusion. And that's quite a common um, appearance in ultrasound. So fetal compromise in um, uh, pulmonary uh, uh, anonymous malformations, um, again, is if they're associated with fetal hydrops where there is associated cardiac embarrassment. Now, the majority um, in 95% of cases at least um, at the cystic lung lesion after 26 weeks starts to regress. And in a proportion of uh, babies with uh, CCAM, you can actually start to um, not visualize on ultrasound the presence of any lesion at all. It's always there, it doesn't go away, but there is a natural regression after the mid um, trimester, the, um, so 26 weeks gestation onwards. But in about 5% of cases at that gestation from about 24 to 30 weeks of gestation, you get decompensation. And that's usually associated with fetal hydrops with mediastinal deviation, uh, inferior vena cava compression and increased preload. And it is possible to try and predict 
the possibility of that happening by having a, um, a, a, a ratio of the length of the um, uh, um, CCAM uh, multiplied by the width by the height in centimeters divided by the head circumference. And if the ratio is greater than 1.6, then it's, it's, it's um, associated with a significantly increased risk of the baby developing fecal hydrops later on in gestation. And certainly at the very least, those babies need further careful follow-up. And in many cases, it's an indication to consider some form of intervention before hydrops develops. Pluramniotic shunting can be used in macrocystic CCAMs. So you can see here um, the, uh, a macrocystic lesion in the right hemithorax prior and after to placement of a, of a thoracic amniotic shunt. Uh, and that can prevent hydrops fetalis developing. And this is in real time, an ultrasound you can see before the insertion of the shunt and at the time um, in this 21 year old uh, nulliparous woman at 22 weeks, there was a large right-sided macrocystic lesion that was thought to be a, a CCAM with incites, and we inserted a thoracoamniotic rocket shunt. Um, the only complication being that the mother had a body mass index of 32. And you can see, the shunt one end um, in the macrocyst, the other end outside in the amniotic cavity. And again, the data on CCAMs, the cumulative evidence is that when treated in this way, about there is overall about a 75% survival rate in babies treated this way. When there is CCAM, in other words, there is no separate feeding vessel or the blood supply to the lungs and the one abnormal segment, uh, developmental segment of the lung um, is from the pulmonary circulation. Um, these tables come from um, the book Fecal Therapy and the chapter written by uh, Doug Wilson from, from, um, Cal from Calgary. Um, and so if uh, obviously they're on the slides here, but you can always look at that text for further information. It's problematic though, you can't put a shunt in a baby that has microcystic disease. And these are the, these are the pregnancies that are statistically much more likely to, to, to be associated with a high PVR ratio and also to either present with fetal hydrops or develop uh, fetal hydrops. And in those circumstances, the most common treatment are if the parents decline termination of pregnancy, is by trying to ablate the feeding vessel, either by percutaneous interstitial laser or by radiofrequency ablation. Now in CCAM, if there is no feeding vessel, um, interstitial lasers can be used. And we have one case that we described in the literature with resolution of fetal hydrops and delivery at 33 weeks gestation. But if you look at the literature, um, only, um, 25% of these babies actually survive in, in microcystic CCAM disease. In other words, no feeding vessel. In the babies that have um, uh, bronchopulmonary sequestration with a feeding vessel, then um, it's more amenable to treatment with interfetal laser. And I was involved in a systematic review and pooling cases with uh, um, uh, Dr. Rano from um, uh, the United States. And in that group, there seemed to be a much improved survival because of the ability to ablate the feeding vessel. And in, those, in that uh, systematic review and case series, or a summary of case series, there was 88% survival. Again, the cumulative evidence in, indicates that that's the case with improved survival if there's a feeding vessel. Historically, though, you heard about uh, Prof Professor Eve Ville talk about um, talk about uh, um, uh, Mike Harrison, um, and uh, uh, he was um, the, the father of fetal therapy and open fetal surgery. And certainly in the um, 80s through to the 90s, there were series that um, were produced with open fetal surgery and thoracotomy and fetal lobectomy. 
but it suffered the same kind of problems of many uh, aspects of open fecal surgery, the need for maternal anesthesia and infection, preterm risks of preterm pre-labor ruptured membranes of up to 30%, preterm labor, uh, and of course, thinning of the uterine scar and potential dehiscence. So for the most part, that has fallen out of favor. It wouldn't be right for me to complete this lecture without talking about the possibility. It is very exciting to rush in and do things and do things heroically that involve fetal therapy. But there is some evidence, albeit from small cohort studies from the United States, that maternal corticosteroids may have a, an effect in terms of causing uh, regression of um, large lung lesions, particularly type three CCAMs or microcystic lung lesions. And those are given in a dose of um, better metazone um, that is very, um, is, is the same as for lung maturation. So 12 milligrams um, twice uh, uh, intramuscularly over 24 hours or four doses of six milligrams over 24 hours. And there has been evidence of regression in um, a significant proportion of cases in two retrospective series. But of course, these need to be, um, these are anecdotal and they need to be reproduced by randomized controlled trials. But it is interesting that um, there does seem to be some benefit. So in conclusion, thoracoamniotic shunting should be considered in the management of um, uh, fetal hydrothoraces, which it should also be considered in large macrocystic CCAMs or microcystic um, uh, CCAM or bronchial pulmonary dysplasia, where the CVR ratio is indicative that the baby will develop hydrops or indeed has already developed hydrops. It is important, like all fetal anomalies, that before you consider fetal therapy, there is triage of the baby by detailed ultrasound scan in a tertiary unit and consideration for um, investigation to exclude um, other pathologies, which will have such as structural abnormalities or chromosomal and genetic abnormalities that will have an independent impact on neurodevelopment of the fetus long-term and indeed survival. So um, I'm going to stop there and I'll be very happy to take questions on discussion. Thank you. Bây giờ là đến phần đặt câu hỏi cho các giáo sư xin trọng kính mời các anh chị đặt câu hỏi ạ. À. Các anh chị tham gia online đọc câu hỏi vào phần hộp chat ạ. À. À, một lần nữa cảm ơn cái bài giải của của các thầy rất là hay à, em có hai câu hỏi câu hỏi thứ nhất là liên quan tới các vấn đề về sepam đó thì thầy nói là về các vấn đề điều trị bằng là corticosteroid đó, cho trong cái trường hợp mà sepam đó thì là cũng rất là controversial tức là cũng rất là bạo lực có người nói là hiệu quả có người nói là hiệu quả thì giúp cho thầy có vẻ hiệu quả nhưng mà vấn đề em đặt ra là như vậy để mình chọn lựa để cái corticoid đó tại vì hiện nay cái 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 lợi ích của tiết trên cái cái hại của nó thì bộ não của người ta đề cập tới vấn đề uh, ảnh hưởng của não em bé đó thì như vậy nếu mình chọn một chất corticosteroid đó thì mình chọn chất ở thời điểm nào nó gần lúc mình nghĩ là nó sẽ tạo ra hydrophobic cái thời điểm nào mình sẽ cho chất corticosteroid ở thời điểm nào mình chích tại vì đó là câu hỏi thứ nhất câu hỏi thứ hai nữa là trong cái buổi mà buổi sáng đó, thì có rất nhiều cái đó không biết sáng có thể là cepam có thể là cekes có thể là cancelitol uh, thì thầy có thể có một cái, 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 cái hướng dẫn để mà mình có thể cho nó phân biệt giữa những cái đó hay không ạ à? giữa những cái 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 phụ sáng một câu hỏi thứ ba cũng liên quan tới vấn đề điều trị về bà mẹ rất là lăng tăng à, rất là thì không biết những trường hợp mà bị cekam đó và đặc biệt là những trường hợp bị cekes đó 
thì cái thời điểm nào là chọn lựa để can thiệp can thiệp sau sinh nếu như bệnh nhân không có một triệu chứng gì trước sinh cả thì cái thời điểm nào là thời điểm chọn lựa để can thiệp sau sinh CK cũng như CKS và đặc biệt là cái trường hợp là CKS và dưới hoạt nó trong bụng đó, thì cái thời điểm nào là thời điểm thuộc lợi để mình can thiệp cảm ơn các thầy Okay, so let me just unpack that because it's one of the questions in there. Um, so the first thing I emphasize that steroids are, are controversial and um, are anecdotal in their use. I think um, there is controversy about giving multiple doses of steroids during pregnancy in terms of brain development. But um, in the context of this particular problem or any problem in fetal therapy where there may be benefits in the overall outlook for the pregnancy carries high perinatal morbidity and mortality, then um, I think it's worth considering. In our, in our unit, we certainly haven't, to be honest with you, significantly delayed intervention if we have used it um, and haven't been over keen on, the, on that potential use. Um, it's been used um really for, uh, at most up to a week before we've considered treatment um but i but i'm i think mainly it's been um for the proponents for its use have been from north america um and as i say if i if it is going to be utilized in main line treatment i think it should be um within the, the context of a trial as a, and having an international randomized controlled trial with uh, an escape clause, if you like. So in other words, after a finite length of time, if there is no improvement, then you, get, then you resort to um, uh, uh, shunting, then that would be reasonable. So I think within a, a trial would probably be the best setting for steroids. I think in terms of the differential diagnosis, as I've said, is a combination of uh, real-time ultrasound, um, MRI sometimes is useful, um and um using low flow and color flow doppler to try and identify whether there's a separate feeding vessel or not um bronchial pulmonary sequestrations not exclusively but often are microcystic and have a, a separate blood supply so they can be usually um diagnosed um so uh, there, there is always uncertainty and sometimes the uh, the uh, pediatric surgeons will say well you can never be sure about what you're actually seeing until it's been operated on and removed and we have a histological diagnosis so i accept that but i think with um a with a, with a degree a re reasonable degree of, of prognostic success you can help to define whether or not there's a ccam or um uh, bronchial pulmonary sequestration or not in the context of a, a microcystic lung lesion which is going to need treatment. It may be that you have no choice and both need to be treated by intrafetal laser, but the prognosis, as I indicated, is better for one rather than the other, i.e. the bronchial pulmonary sequestration. Um, the final thing is I think extra lobar um, sequestrations in babies that have fetal hydrops and are in, um, uh, are, are in trouble from cardiac dysfunction that are always going to be problematic in how you treat them. And probably overall, they carry the greatest risks of, um, uh, of um, failure, failed fail treatment or complications of treatment. And I guess the only, con the only thing to say about that is that if therefore they are presenting in the third trimester, perhaps towards the mid third trimester, there needs to be multidisciplinary discussion about whether there is the right thing to manage these babies in utero or whether there might be a role for delivery, early preterm delivery. But that discussion would need to be based upon the gestation of the baby, the condition of the baby when the diagnosis is made, and in conjunction with multidisciplinary discussion with the pediatric surgeons and neonatal team. Thank you.
À, trước hết em xin cảm ơn giáo sư vì một bài giảng rất là hay em có bốn câu hỏi liên quan tới cái vấn đề điều trị à, cái thứ nhất thì chúng ta thấy là những cái trường hợp tràn dịch măng phổi ấy, thì có một số trường hợp thì nó từ thoái triển sau 4 đến 8 tuần à, vậy câu hỏi là tiêu chuẩn nào để chúng ta chỉ định đặc sinh măng phổi à, câu hỏi thứ hai đó là liên quan tới cái tuổi thai thế thì tuổi thai nào thì chúng ta sẽ không còn chỉ định đặc sinh măng phổi nữa À, bởi vì những cái trường trường hợp trang dịch măng phổi thì thường giai đoạn cuối thai kỳ nó sẽ có cái tình trạng nó bị đá ổi thì uh, theo quan sát ấy, những trường hợp mà uh, thực hiện đặc sinh vào ấy thì nó sau đấy cũng vài ngày thì nó sinh non do ổi nó nhiều nữa à, vậy thì tuổi thai nào thì chúng ta có thể uh, không đặc sinh nữa và chúng ta chỉ định chấm dứt thai kỳ à, câu hỏi thứ ba là liên quan tới cái chọc hút dịch măng phổi à, thế thì trên thực tế thì À, có những cái trung tâm ở Việt Nam nó không có đủ trang thiết bị để đặc sân à, thành ra một cái giải pháp để chọn lừa thay thế đó là hút dịch mang phổi à, và à, có những cá thì hút ra cả một trăm đến một trăm năm mươi ml thì ba ngày sau thì bắt đầu cái dịch mang phổi nó lại trang lên lại và nó trang nhiều như cũ vậy thì trong những trường hợp đấy thì chúng ta có hút lại lần hai hay không hay là chúng ta không hút và chúng ta chờ đợi để chấm dứt thai kỳ À, đồng thời thì một khi mà uh, tiến hành chọc hút dịch măng phổi ấy, thì một số trường hợp thì chúng ta sẽ chạm vào cái nhũ mô phổi chính vì chạm vào nhũ mô phổi thân ra cái dịch tiết của nó sẽ ra màu đỏ màu hồng màu hoặc màu đỏ vậy thì cái việc mà chúng ta chạm vào cái nhũ phổ mô phổi đấy thì nó có ảnh hưởng tới cái kết cục của em bé hay không xin cảm ơn Um, well, I thought to your last question first, I think um, obviously putting these um, shunts in is uh, highly technical and you need experience to do it. So that's almost, I haven't emphasized that, but that is very, very important um, because um, when I listed the complications, there is the potential risk of fetal or maternal trauma, although that's unlikely um for the lung usually because often the cases that you would put a fetal shunt in or for pleural effusion the pleural effusion is large and therefore it would be unlikely that you that the shunt um could do damage to the to the lung but it's always theoretically possible um yes all pleural effusions are but could be potentially um uh, transient but um as i've said in my introduction slide over three quarters of them are not, and they progress to fetal fibrops. So the presence of, for instance, an isolated pleural effusion, um, it is reasonable um, to either watch, but I think that has to be our names to then plan treatment. But also remember, I said that these babies need to be triaged, so they need a detailed ultrasound scan. And then there needs to be a discussion with the parents about whether there is an underlying cause that may um, worsen the prognosis or have an associated morbidities, comorbidities, other than the presence of the pleural effusion, chromosome abnormalities, potentially genetic problems. And so, if I, perhaps if I give you a vignette of a case, um, there I saw a case in my fetal genetics clinic of a baby that presented at 21 weeks. She worked in the hospital and had just had a mid trimester scan and was rushed around at 20 weeks. And the baby had a right-sided pearl effusion. Um, the baby had um, a small VSD and it had long bones that were straight, but they were all on the fifth center of the gestation. And so we discussed the possibility of karyotyping um, and that baby, um, she opted for me to do to drain the right side of pleural effusion and also to do an amniocentesis. So we sent both of those samples off for karyotype to check the chromosomes, which came back as normal. And we've just started in the UK doing um, exome sequencing for genetics. And over that took four months, four weeks to the, for the result to come back. But in the meantime, um, the baby's pleural effusion did not come back. The cardiologists, fetal cardiologists scanned the baby and thought that the VSD, if it was small at all, looked like it was closing, 
The baby was in a breech position and sitting on its feet, but we thought the baby had syndactyly. And um, then later going through, the baby was growing, the long bones were all short, um, but the baby had a genetic variant um, that was associated with Gaunt syndrome, which is a, uh, an abnormality of skeletal development. The parents choose, chose to continue on with the pregnancy and the baby was delivered at term and had orthopedic repair of the syndactyly of its feet. So though that pleural effusion never came back, but it showed it, it, it was the present, presenting part for a genetic disease. And indeed, postnatally, the baby had multiple small VSDs that required closing. So it just gives you an example. It's possible for it to regress and you not to need to do paraphyamnetic shunting, but it doesn't mean necessarily that there's not a serious underlying cause. But the majority of them, if you tap the chest, do come back. And often they come back and they start to get worse. Like if it's unilateral pleural effusion, they become bilateral or develop hypox. And in those kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, babies, remote from the possibility of delivery, then you're going to need to consider intervention. Xin mời các anh chị trong hội trường, ai có nội dung gì cần trao đổi với giảng viên xin mời đặt câu hỏi ạ. Các anh chị tham gia online có thể đặt câu hỏi vào trong hòm hòm book ạ. Em có câu hỏi muốn hỏi thầy ạ. Em muốn hỏi thầy về tuần cai mà mình bắt đầu làm cái săn uh, uh, săn uh, uh, dịch màng phổi và dẫn lưu màng phổi và và dẫn lưu màng ối ạ. Câu thứ hai là có một cái mốc giải phẫu nào đấy để mình uh, mình 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 đặt cái săn đấy không ạ? Ok, so probably um, the earliest you could put a chance would, would be between 16 and 20 weeks gestation, probably about 18 weeks gestation. Um, as I indicated, the Harrison shunt is slightly smaller than the, than the, um, the Rodex shunt, um, but really that's about the earliest you could probably insert the, the shunt. Um, anatomical landmarks are, are difficult, I think, although you would want to avoid the fetal heart and you would want to um, try and insert the drain at the maximal point of the pleural effusion, so where the pleural effusion is most largest. It's difficult sometimes to insert the shunt and not usually you go between the ribs and usually you, even if you feel the introducer touching the rib, usually it goes then deflects and goes through the intercostal space, which is fine. A complication of this procedure can be though that you can fracture a rib going in to, to drain this procedure. But that's, that's, um, that, that happens and usually it's not associated with detrimental problems long-term. But um, to avoid obviously the heart, which is uh, a way away from where you're putting the, the shunt in and to put it in the area where there's a maximum effusion and only to put it in pearl effusions where you think there's significant size. So small rims of pearl effusion are not the cases to start to think about putting Paracoramnotic shunts in one because they don't require them, because they're not likely to be associated with cardiovascular in, or cardiac embarrassments in the fetus. And secondly, they will be technically very challenging. And thirdly, they will be associated with very high risks of pregnancy loss. Go on. <laughs> um, if they're bilateral, um, usually uh, what, what we do is I, I put um, usually two shunts in, but I usually put one shunt in, wait a while, and then put another one in about three or four days later. But it really does depend. If, if 
it, it depends a little bit on the gestation and how the access. So if the access is very good, then I will put them both in at the same time. So the mother has to just go one through one sedation. I think uh, you're spoiled for choice for drains these days, actually, but um, sort of um, uh, the, the choice is, I know, I think Eve uses Harish and Shunts, most of all. Yeah, I, I, I started to use them, but I found that, uh, um, that with, especially with a uh, thoracic insertion, um, if there is edema of the, the thoracic wall, they can sometimes pinch off and block, whereas the Rodex shunts that are silastic and tougher don't tend to do that so much. But as I indicated, um, Rodex shunts are being temporary, the plastic that they're using is being temporary, uh, being revised by the manufacturer, so they've taken them off the market. Um, but the Somatec shunts that are um, made um, in Europe, um, again, are, are, seem to be quite easy to put in once you, like all of these things, it's actually loading the shunt and your, your assistant is the technical person, actually. They're, they're helping you push the shunt into the chest. Um, and it is a bit fiddly to load the Somatex shunt into the needle, but it has the advantage in that um, it goes down a much smaller needle. So an 18, 17 gauge needle, which is significant in terms of the risk of pre-labor ruptured membranes. Um, and once it's loaded, which is the technical bit, it's usually much less of a, of a challenge to unfold the shunt so that one end is in the pleural effusion and the other end is outside in the amniotic cavity. So I've been, I've been pleasantly surprised. The disadvantage of them are that because they're a, um, a, a titanium mesh, the skin on the abdominal wall and the tissues start to grow along it. And therefore, you need to warn your pediatric colleagues that they won't just be able to pull it out. They often just need to clamp it, and it needs a minor operation or the pediatric surgeons to remove it at birth. It's not necessarily a procedure that's for the faint-hearted, though. <clears throat> well, um, that would depend upon where you live in uh, in the world, I suspect, actually. Um, there's no doubt that especially bilateral pleural effusions have potentially got uh, um, a, a high risk of mortality and morbidity. And so in, in the United Kingdom, um, uh, if a baby has a risk of an uh, abnormality that carries um, a handicap, it's possible to opt the birth up to 40 weeks. M1 high, yeah, pretty much. Um, M1 high, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, now I'm a photo page, you sign two people in the world. Well, we just don't make it real. Okay, yeah, more like high, yeah, pretty much high, 